He is known for his adventurous spirit and travels across different regions. He is recognized for being a witness to various historical events and social conditions during his journeys. He is for now Mendez Pinto. In 1537, the adventurous Fernão Mendes Pinto set sail from Lisbon towards a land of mystery and opportunity, India. Joined by a crew of fellow Portuguese sailors, he embarked on a journey that would forever change his life. After a long and treacherous voyage, battling against the elements of the sea, Pinto's ship finally reached its first destination on September 5, 1537, Dio, a fortified island and town located northwest of Bombay. Excitement and anticipation coursed through Pinto's veins as he set foot on this foreign land, eager to explore its wonders and unravel its secrets. But little did Pinto know that his journey had only just begun. He soon joined a Portuguese reconnaissance mission to the Red Sea, passing through the exotic lands of Ethiopia. Their mission was twofold, to deliver a crucial message to the Portuguese soldiers guarding the mother of Prester John and to gather valuable information about the region. Leaving the port of Masawa, the Portuguese ships set sail towards their destination. However, fate had different plans in store for them. As they neared the Red Sea, they encountered three menacing Turkish galleys, ready to engage in battle. The clash was fierce, but unfortunately, the Portuguese ships were defeated, and their crews captured to be sold as slaves. Pinto found himself at the mercy of a cruel fate as he was sold to a Greek Muslim, who treated him with utmost cruelty and disdain. The days turned into nights of suffering as Pinto endured the hardships of enslavement. Desperate and filled with despair, he contemplated suicide as a means of escape from his torment. But fortune smiled upon him, as Pinto's life took an unexpected turn. He was sold once again, this time to a Jewish merchant, who recognized his potential and saw an opportunity for profit. In exchange for approximately 30 ducats worth of dates, Pinto became the property of this new master. Together with his Jewish merchant owner, Pinto embarked on a perilous journey along the ancient caravan routes to the vibrant market town of Hormuz, nestled in the Persian Gulf. The scorching desert sands stretched endlessly before them, and danger lurked at every turn. Yet, Pinto's resilience and determination remained unyielding. Upon reaching Hormuz, Pinto's fortunes changed once more. The Portuguese crown, through payment of 300 ducats, secured his freedom. Not only was he liberated from the chains of slavery, but he was also appointed as the captain of the prestigious fortress of Hormuz, entrusted with the responsibility of protecting Portuguese interests in the region. Moreover, he assumed the role of the Portuguese king's special magistrate for Indian affairs, a position of great influence and prestige. As Pinto reflected on his extraordinary journey, he marveled at the twists and turns of fate that had brought him to this moment. From the treacherous seas to the harrowing battles, from enslavement to liberation, his experiences had shaped him into a seasoned traveler and a resilient survivor. But little did Pinto know that his adventures were far from over. More challenges and discoveries awaited him in the vast expanses of India, as he continued to navigate a world filled with wonders, dangers, and the tantalizing promise of unimaginable riches. For now Mendez Pinto found himself in the bustling city of Malacca, serving under the newly appointed captain, Pedro de Faria. His mission was clear, establish diplomatic contacts with small kingdoms allied with the Portuguese against the Muslims of northern Sumatra. Pinto's role as a diplomat took him on a journey of cultural exchange and perilous encounters. In 1569, Pinto's path took an unexpected turn when he stumbled upon an Ottoman fleet led by Kurtigla Heiser Reis in Aceh. This encounter not only highlighted the complexity of the political landscape in the region but also revealed the ever-present threat from the powerful Ottoman Empire. Undeterred by this encounter, Pinto's next assignment led him to Patani, on the eastern shore of the Malay Peninsula. It was here that he attempted to deliver merchandise to Siam, only to have it stolen by pirates. Determined to recover the stolen goods, Pinto and his companion, Antonio de Faria, embarked on a chase, braving the treacherous waters of the South China Sea. Their pursuit led them into the Gulf of Tonkin, where they engaged in trading operations amidst the vast expanse of the sea. Pinto's explorations eventually brought him to the shores of China, entering from the Yellow Sea. The allure of the unknown beckoned him as he raided a tomb of the Emperor of China, an audacious act that would have dire consequences. Faced with the wrath of the Chinese authorities, Pinto found himself shipwrecked, apprehended, and sentenced to a year of hard labor on the Great Wall of China. His resilience and resourcefulness kept him going in the face of adversity. However, before completing his sentence, Pinto's fate took yet another unexpected turn. He was taken prisoner by invading Tatars and became an agent of the Tartars. Together, they embarked on a journey that would lead them to Cochinchina, a land in the southernmost part of modern-day Cambodia and Vietnam. It was in this exotic land that Pinto encountered a figure akin to a pope-like man, 
possibly the Dalai Lama himself, who had never heard of Europe. The encounter served as a testament to the vast cultural differences that Pinto encountered in his travels. Seeking new horizons, Pinto and his two companions jumped ship to a Chinese pirate junk, only to find themselves shipwrecked once again. This time, destiny guided them to the distant Japanese island of Tanegashima, south of Kyushu. Pinto claimed the distinction of being the first European to set foot in Japan in 1543. He also asserted that he introduced the arquebus, a firearm, to the land. However, it is now widely acknowledged that several Portuguese traders had already visited Japan a year earlier. Nevertheless, the introduction of the firearm played a significant role in the Japanese civil wars, leaving a lasting impact on the country's history. Pinto's experiences in Japan did not end there. He became a facilitator of trade between the Portuguese and the Japanese, navigating the intricate web of commerce. It was during his time in Japan that he encountered the Ryukyu Islands, where he experienced further trials and tribulations as he navigated the challenging waters surrounding the archipelago. In 1549, Pinto embarked on a new chapter of his life, leaving Kagoshima accompanied by a Japanese fugitive named Anjiro. Together, they returned to Japan with St. Francis Xavier, a Catholic missionary. This marked a significant shift in Pinto's journey as he joined the Society of Jesus in 1554, dedicating himself to the Catholic mission. He generously donated a substantial sum of his trading wealth to support the mission's efforts. Pinto's allegiance to the church led to his appointment as the Viceroy of Portuguese India's ambassador to the daimyo of Bungo on the island of Kyushu. However, despite his support for the church, he eventually parted ways with the Jesuits in 1557, embarking on a new chapter of his life. Returning to Malacca, Pinto found himself sent to Martaban in the midst of a devastating siege. Seeking refuge in a Portuguese camp, he quickly realized that betrayal lurked at every corner. Captured by the Burmese, Pinto was placed under the charge of the king's treasurer, who took him to the kingdom of Kalamanum. Faced with an uncertain future, Pinto seized the opportunity and fled to Goa, seeking solace and safety. Upon his return to Goa, Pinto was sent on yet another mission, this time to Bantam, Java, with the objective of procuring pepper for trade with China. However, fate dealt a cruel hand once again, as he found himself shipwrecked for the umpteenth time. The harsh circumstances forced him to resort to extreme measures, possibly even resorting to cannibalism in order to survive the swampy shores of Java. Eventually, he became enslaved and was bought by a Celebes merchant, only to be resold to the king of Kalapa, who returned him to Sunda. Resourceful and determined, Pinto borrowed money to secure passage to Siam, where he found himself amidst a war led by the king. His observations and accounts of the conflict contribute to the historical record, providing insight into this turbulent period of Siam's history. Pinto's extraordinary voyages through Malacca and the Far East exemplify the indomitable spirit of exploration and discovery. Through hardship and adversity, he navigated the unfamiliar landscapes and encountered diverse cultures, leaving an indelible mark on history and deepening the world's understanding of these regions. His experiences were not only a testament to his own resilience but also a reflection of the broader exploration process that shaped the world during this time. In the late 16th century, a man named Fernau embarked on a remarkable journey that would shape his life and the history of Portuguese colonialism in the Far East. For now, despite lacking the formal education of his contemporaries, possessed a wealth of experiential knowledge and intelligence that allowed him to create a remarkable memoir. In 1569, he began penning his experiences, which would later be published posthumously in 1614 by Friar Belchior Faria. For now's memoirs were unlike any other literature of his time. His tales were so extraordinary and implausible that they often bordered on the unbelievable. It was said that his stories were so far-fetched that people coined the phrase, for now, mentes. Minto. A Portuguese pun on his name that meant, for now, do you lie? I do. The publication of his memoirs, however, differed from for now's original manuscript. Notably, references to the Society of Jesus, an active religious order in the Orient, were mysteriously removed. This omission was puzzling, as there were clear indications of for now's relationship with the society. It raised doubts about the historical accuracy of his accounts. Nonetheless, his memoirs provided valuable insights into the impact of Asian civilizations on Europeans and offered a critical analysis of Portuguese actions in the Orient. Among Fernau's most controversial claims was his assertion of being the first European to visit Japan and introducing the arquebus to the country. Historians have scrutinized this claim, with some questioning its validity. The Dutch historian P. A. Jela, writing in 1880, expressed skepticism about Fernau's presence during the Java campaign, suggesting that his information was derived from second-hand sources. 
Despite the doubts, Tiela acknowledged that Fernau's account could not be disregarded due to the scarcity of alternative information about Javanese history during that time. Maurice Collis, another historian, believed that while not entirely true, Fernau's accounts remained compatible with historical events. Collis considered Fernau's work the most comprehensive European account of 16th century Asia. Fernau Mendez Pinto's memoirs were a fascinating exploration of his experiences in the Far East. Although his lack of formal education and the improbable nature of his stories raised doubts about their accuracy, his work offered valuable insights into the encounters between Europeans and Asian civilizations. Through his memoirs, Fernau challenged the prevailing narratives of Portuguese colonialism and left an indelible mark on the understanding of 16th century Asian history. If you want to discover more adventurers on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button for my channel, and don't forget to leave a comment in the section below, telling us which adventurers you'd like us to feature next.